This is my mother's story. She is 45 years old and was born in 1973 in Iraq and stayed there for most of her life. I decided to interview my mother, who is called Ola. She came all the way from Nigeria. I have decided to write about my mum because she has lived in four places before. These places were Somalia, Italy, Switzerland and the UK. My dad is originally from and was born in Libya. My grandma was born on the 3rd of August 1954 at Mutala Mohammed International Hospital, Nigeria, Lagos. My mother Shema lived in a place called Kurdistan until she was 16. My dad was born on March 18th, 1978 in the capital city of Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. My father was born and raised in the rural parts of Baydor, Somalia. Nakana was born in 1981. She grew up in a small village within Udon Thani with her mum, dad, two sisters and brother. My mother's name is Fatim. She was born in 1973 in Iraq and stayed there for most of her life. My father was born and raised in the rural parts of Baydor, Somalia. He was raised by his mother and father on a farm. My interview is about my grandmother. She's from West Pakistan, but lived in Assam, Bangladesh. Her life was considered to be very ordinary. As a child, she played Ludo and Hopscotch. When interviewing her, my grandmother sounded happy talking about her childhood games and stories. And she still sometimes plays Ludo with me and my brother today. Somalia, at the time of his childhood, was a very peaceful and beautiful place to live in. She had many friends and other family living there, and the weather was always nice and hot. She had enjoyed living there because everyone felt as if they knew each other personally and the weather was nice. He enjoyed the lively environment. Easy of all the country of joy and peace. She said she was happy that with all of the culture she grew up with and see her children every day was like a miracle. She had liked her life and it states it was busy but fun. My dad liked Somalia because it was very hot and he liked to live with his family. He thought that Somalia was very beautiful. He told me that he enjoyed living in Somalia as he felt accepted and he had many friends and family there. She had enjoyed living there because everyone felt as if they knew each other personally and the weather was nice. She enjoyed going to school and had lots of friends. He loved his country dearly, especially his family and friends. He said that in Somalia he liked the food because it was very traditional. She's from Bangladesh and it, she said it was a really nice place but it would get really hot on some days. Life in Nigeria was tough. My mother had to work two jobs. She had to wake up at 5am every day to go to her first job and she would end at 10am. Then she would go to school and then go and take care of my grandma's business. Living in Bangladesh meant it was quite hot all year round and there was no toothbrushes so soot was used instead. My grandmother was quite happy living there, apart from the heat, until Bangladesh war started. He said that a civil war broke out in 1991. Because all of his family lived in Somalia, he decided that he was going to stay with his family because he thought that his family were very important. When the civil war began, everything was said to be absolute chaos. People were getting death threats and people she knew were being killed. She said that suddenly on the news there was a report of a bomb in one of the big cities, but no one thought of it as a big thing until it started becoming repetitive and everyone in the country wanted answers. She remembered that she saw the leaders perform his speech and there was a bomb nearby. That's when everyone knew it was serious. My dad is a Kurd and at that time Saddam Hussein, who was a part of the Iraq government, wanted the Kurds to be Arabs and wanted to take away their language and culture. During that time, Nigeria were going through corruption and war against different political parties, especially the two main parties, PDP and APC. There was a dangerous group of people with harmful weapons that were rebelling against the government. He told me that they took over villages like his and stole things from people and hurt them. He said that this was the start of Somalia's collapse. She says that she remembers the floods sounds of gunfire and electric cutouts from where she lived. Her education had also come to a stop because schools were closed down due to the war. The Bangladesh war was one of the reasons that influenced her decision to move to England. He was wanted by the government for reasons that he couldn't help, such as his religion, and unfortunately had to leave. She mentioned that it was too dangerous to stay home at the time and had no choice but to leave as soon as she had the opportunity. He knew at one point he will be at part in one of those thousands of deaths. So he had to leave before a disaster happened.
upside down room. Two adults are talking to each other in a camouflage language. There is no one here you recognise. You reach for suspended memories. A smiling boy, a laughing girl. You breathe in a sense of home. The sun loops itself around your neck and drapes around your shoulder as you walk in your dusty sandals like, like a, a moon, moon king, king or a sun queen. Down narrow streets, insects clicking in distant fields. Where your name is pronounced with the spirit of a prayer. Khalil, friendship calling you in the dusk. Syllables of endearment. Rani, Shazadi princess. Petal, Kul Gumari. Home is sleeping on floors, on roofs, on star bright nights. Open air storytelling. Stories of the travelling soul coming to visit. Welcome, our guest, Sumal. Let us offer you a drink of milk. Wood fire chicken. Cardinal spice vegetables and sorghum. A small coupe of frankincense in the air. Let us scatter crystals of uranium and quartz at your feet. Tell you tales of camels, stars, five-pointed stars. Come. Come. Let us talk to the trees. How are you? Poplars and date palms. Let us confer with the creatures. It's the island. Golden jackals and gazelles. Cyclones and tornadoes. 
monsoons in mangroves, tigers and jackfruits, beetle nuts, crocodiles and cobras, disruptive humans, disrupting nature. Home is caught in the corrupt twist of government regimes, civil war, opposing rebels supported by policies overseas, a global disease, international greed feeding on itself, a snake eating its own tail. Home is a landless zero. Home is the sound of your favorite goat bleating a warning. Bullet holes in the leaking rainbow. Seven shades of bleeding. Home is a shattered shard of a dream, unsafe as recently bombed houses. You witness the unspeakable chaos. A brother dying in your arms. Your homeless spirit asks, Where are you going? Oil, copper, sibling of marble. Boku eroi. Boku eroi. When are you coming back? Play the gelibo? Leaving home, they advise, is for the best. Leaving home a risk, a desperate step. Disembodied hope leaped like a hop, skip, and jump in your grandmother's game of Ludo. From wounded homes to borrowed lands, from one continent to another. Home is gone. <laughs> gone. <laughs> gone. Home is gone. Home is family disputes. Resolved by village elders, wide hit wise women and lofty men, turmeric and a prayer soaked talisman. Home is the cure for homesick. Home is gone. 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 Home is gone. Home is a long blessing against the evil eye. Home is tall tower blocks burning down. Home is mud daubed bungalows quaking. A bamboo home flooded. Higher. Higher than the highest stilt. Home is always taken for granted until it is gone. Home is gone. Gone, gone, gone. Home is gone. Home is tangy tamarind eating out of the same plate for the last time. Packing your stuff in a rush. Home is what you can't leave behind. Gone. If you have to leave, say goodbye to your favourite goat with your eyes closed. Don't look back at Grandma standing at the door telling Habad peace, I'll be fine it's your time. When she pushes you to go go. go. go.
Many people started to immigrate to countries such as England and America. However, only the few who were either rich or had good grades were able to leave the country. His parents pushed him to the max so he'd be able to move from Ethiopia to go to a university in England so he could live a good life. When he was 25, my dad decided that he was going to make a change and move to Italy with his brother. He decided to move because the war had gotten out of hand. In the early 1990s, when he was around eight or nine, he had to move to Ethiopia. This was because his parents wanted him and his family to be safe. As well as being safe, his parents wanted him to be educated and to have a better future. She said that she really didn't want to move because she had lived a great life there and felt she had lost a chunk of herself when she left. It was a hard decision to make, but her and her husband at the time knew the right thing to do was to travel to England and escape the war so their children could have a proper future. In 2001, she migrated to Britain by a plane with her husband because during that time, Iraq was at war and the conditions were not very good. Mom didn't want to stay in Switzerland anymore because she was being treated differently to everyone else just because she was a refugee. She said that she wanted to move to a country anywhere in the world. She wanted to move to a country that had equality. The decision was made that she was going to move to Manchester, find a house, see a school nearby for her kids, but she was going to travel on her own. She said travelling on her own and leaving her kids was terrible, but it was scary to not know if you were going to be accepted. After a few years of the war going on, my mum got the opportunity that many didn't. Due to her young age and the danger she was in, England gave her a visa along with some other family to come and live in the UK, Manchester. She was 19 at the time. Before moving, she had to do an interview to have the right to travel. The woman before her had come out crying because she was denied access to travel on the airplane. Thankfully, my grandmother managed to go on the airplane without many issues. She came all the way from Nigeria on an eight-hour flight to the UK, which she paid for with her own money. My father told me that leaving Somalia was very hard. They had to travel long distances across deserts and rivers. In 1999, my dad and his family went to Denmark. He had to travel by ferry with many hundreds of people. He said that he was scared that an accident might occur or something might go wrong. For her, moving was a case of life or death. She traveled for two days on foot with my grandfather and my uncle, who was still a baby, without any supplies towards the border of India. So when they crossed it, they'd be safe. If they were seen by soldiers, they'd be shot instantly for being Hindu, due to the divide rising in nearby countries. During that time, they never had a proper house and they slept on the floor with no roof. He moved from Kurdistan to Turkey by a plane and then moved to Turkey to England by a truck, which took him 10 days. And in those 10 days, he saw many people die and suffer because of the conditions they had been put through. This was a difficult journey as he was trying to get away from the chaos back home. It was a tough time in which his families got split up and everyone had to fight for themselves. Luckily, it didn't happen to them as quickly as other families as they all moved together. She travelled here by herself, by plane, leaving her mother, two brothers and her sister behind in Bangladesh. Despite the fact it was hard saying goodbye, she felt that it was time to start a new life elsewhere. She found the journey a little hard as she didn't understand English well at first, but the flight itself was quick and comfortable. Michael was going to be leaving her home for a long time. She was unsure if she would ever return. At the same time as grandma pushes me to go, I feel an equal and opposite pull of need from someone behind a terrace door in Hardwick. We don't know it yet, but we are to become neighbours. I set a feeling something good is in the pipeline. By ship! By play! By any means necessary! By trap! By luck! By hop, skip! And jump! Over fear and anxiety! By ferry, by boat, by, by the scuff of my coat! With documents. Visa and passport in my pocket. You call, I say, as I step through custom control. Welcome, Welcome said, said the smiling hostess. hostess. Hold, on, Hold on, said the, the man, man in the peaked hat. hat. The airport is a suspicious stranger. Check in under my outstretched arms. A human cross. A thousand, thousand blessings, blessings for the, the travellers. travellers.
travellers, the risk takers, the ones who dare to enter. Inscrutable screen, entrance conditional. Cool whispers and the sterile air conditioning. Indefinite risk of detention. A future, future memory. memory. I rummage through my mind for the right words to explain to the woman in the official navy shirt why I have come. I feel nervous, unsure. She checks on the list which country I'm from. Another droplet of need and want. Like the others in the queue behind me, Offering more skills than the next one. I want to be a seamstress who hems tea towels for pennies. I want to cross stitch denim jeans in a factory. I want to be a vendor, an operator, and an NHS doctor. I want to be a male nurse, a carer, a cleaner. I want to be your university qualified taxi driver. Sorry, the Zarkarnia. All kept waiting. A line, a queue, a reinforced glass barrier. A separate room, an application form, an on-the-spot interview. Recruitment and unnatural selection. Name, title, purpose for visit, address of sponsor, next of kin, country of origin. Verbal frisking. Without a word of warning, from inside the sea of my borrowed jacket, a piece of the African blue sky ballooning to the ceiling. A five-pointed star peaked on my top lapel. My left sock surrenders heat like a Somali summer afternoon. The woman in the queue behind me is unexpectedly paddling in rice fields. She lifts her sari above her glistening ankles. Her documents floating like Bengali lotus flowers in the waiting airport lounge. This part of the journey is as difficult as crossing the River Jordan or the Duba Ad Shabil. Easy peasy for the pearly rivers of people leaving on vacation, travelling fast downstream with no restrictions. British holiday makers returning, smooth wheeling duty free. In a long, unmoving, non EU queue, attention turned to a young Kurdish man. The sound of thunderous drumming from inside the heart of his smart jacket. With no warning at custom control, 
a leopard leaps over the woman who checks my cases. A camel carrying frankincense is on the luggage carousel. From a split open suitcase, a rhino's horn declaring nothing concealed. Virtual bursting through a blue checkered nylon bag and huge cardboard boxes. Each one labelled fragile. fragile. Jackfruit. <laughs> Mangrove forest pacing tiger. Crocodiles, cobras, and dolphins. Conifers, poplars, willows, and date palms. <laughs> A brown bear. A striped hyena. Golden jackal. A goitered gazelle. Copper, gold, forest and oil. Priceless memories of homeland resources. Weightless treasures over limit, declaring nothing. The official's disbelieving eyes scan from my face to the unflinching photo on my passport. Casually, a giraffe sidles by, lifts the invisible barrier with its neck. There is nothing between me and the official. We smile. Her hand hovers like a hoof print, an ink mark stamps my arrival. Alakazi. Unlock, Unlock the door and turn the key.
Bianca and her mum arrived at Manchester Airport. She was excited at the thought of a new start, with the memory of the cold Mancunian air hitting her face as she got off the plane, still sends chills running back down her spine. She described herself as scared because she did not know the country or the language. She was unsure of what it was like in the UK, so was nervous and a bit excited to come here. She didn't know what to expect. She reached England in 1991 and said that after getting off the airplane, England welcomed her well. She said that the buildings were different. She also said there was more land than there is today. She said that everything was less expensive. I moved to England because there were more and better job opportunities in England. My parents wanted to offer me and my brother the chance of a better education. He thought that Italy wasn't the right place for him and he didn't feel very settled and decided to move to England. She came to England because she felt there is less pressure here and that her children would have, have a better education. She wanted to have a fresh start in the UK with more job opportunities, meet new people and make more friends. Her parents moved her to Manchester to have a much better childhood. When Michael first saw her new home, she was extremely nervous. Michael wondered how this new community would treat her and her family. She knew it would be difficult as she didn't know how things went. She had described England as a small place with many factories. I was shocked by the constantly changing weather and the grim conditions with seemingly constant rain. When she moved to Manchester, she moved into the area called Beswick and she said that her first neighbours were not very welcoming. When I first moved to Openshaw, my life was a struggle. It took her two years to feel settled in Britain because she had missed her family. She did not know anyone here apart from the ones whom she arrived with. My dad faced a few problems when he first arrived here, such as finding a place to live and even racism and xenophobia. Currently, she's unemployed because she only had a certificate for her own country and she can't get a job in Britain with it. My dad was working a 12-hour job with a low wage, but my family always made the effort to remain close. When asked how she found settling here, she described herself as being a mixture of scared but also happy and blessed. My mum felt quite insecure and homesick when she first moved to Manchester and it took her a year and a half to settle in. I'm not sure my family has really settled yet, as we still don't have a car and therefore we have to walk, travel by bus or taxi to get around. She also found it very difficult to communicate with people because she couldn't speak English. When learning English, she found it very hard, but she still practiced every day and went to college to study English more. She can speak English quite well now and you can understand her pretty much anytime she speaks. Although she enjoys it here in Manchester, she likes it in Kurdistan better. It's hotter there than it is here, and she says it's very miserable and rainy here. Even though she feels safer now, she would still move back to Pakistan if she had the chance to, as my grandma passed away and she would feel more comfortable if she was there. When she first moved here, she settled in quite easily. The community and local neighbours treated her very well, so she knew many people. She has two children, an older daughter and a younger son. It has been 17 years since she has migrated to Britain, and she does not plan on leaving.
A smiling boy. A laughing, a laughing girl. girl. There's a buzz in Ardwick. <laughs> Dean Trust Secondary School. A corridor of wide open doors to classrooms. A generation asking questions, ready to be pollinated. A zoo in Bellevue. You learned English from who? How did it feel when you got here? You didn't go back to see Grandma. A zoo in Bellevue. <laughs> you learned English from who? How did it feel when you got here? You didn't go back to see Grandma. A zoo in Bellevue. You learned English from who? How did it feel when you got here? You didn't go back to see Grandma. Uncamouflaged answers. Arriving as fast as Snapchat. Arriving in time for the future. Teenagers. Teaching. The teachers. Things not on the syllabus. Peculiar features of arrival. Surreal faces. Chimneys, red bricks and people. A snapshot of settling in. A damp meme of... A Bengal tiger in Bezik. A cobra in Collier's. A cockatiel in Hume FaceTiming. It's a Marley boy in Ardwick. A, a face you recognise. Getting to know a stranger is how we make friends, you know. <laughs> Your inner tabby cat speaks to my inner tiger. <laughs> A once lonely English neighbour, face lit up bright like a butter lantern on divan. <laughs> with a story. It takes a generation for knowledge to cascade down the second. says three kinds of bins is really confusing, but she reuses tinfoil like it's solid silver. Piccadilly's circular fountain of cultures, getting soaked in five languages, letting go of a drenched map of where you came from. School friends from all around the globe, northern or Southern Hemisphere. Best mates. Best mates with whoever you're sitting next to.
blood is shrinking. Species high-fiving for survival. A young person having a laugh and the sound of a buzzing bee sound the same in any country, under a sycamore tree or coconut palm. Home is wherever you end up on the planet. An infinite scent. Live streaming, love and respect. Hashtag have your say. Hands up if you want to stay. And smell the flowers. I feel a lot of freedom in the roads of Manchester. Its green parks are amazing. The greenery in the parks is a temptation of my everyday walk. England was a beautiful place with very different weather. My mum thought that it rained a lot and it was sometimes very cold. She says that even though the weather is bad in Manchester, she loves it and is glad to call it home. She misses the sunny seaside of Somalia, but she is glad she moved her and made us all safe. The shopping centres keep me busy in the rainy days and the libraries and museums are useful values to know. On the 8th of December 1966, she moved to Manchester with her mum, Adola. Damola's mum picked Manchester because in that time they had a good education and that was one of the main things she wanted to have. Manchester was seen as a very peaceful city. Iman lived in Charlton, Manchester. She said the community in Charlton was very welcoming and by the first month she made a couple of friends. I was amazed by the simple things that would be normal for everyone like double-decker buses. When we arrived I was surprised by the clean streets and thought it was very wonderful. Aris likes Manchester because it is safer and easier to live to support his family and isn't having a constant fear of the Iraqi government trying to kill the Kurds. After a period of time living in Manchester, she felt happy and supported by her friends. He did not face any discrimination and was found to be a friendly man by the locals, which allowed him to make some lifelong friends. The multicultural city has people from different countries who speak different languages and love each other. He told me he loved how multicultural the country was and that many opportunities were open for him. She liked meeting new people and learn about their cultures, as the areas were diverse and multicultural. I developed a relationship with Manchester people to an extent that I called myself Mancunian. When I arrived, I was treated with love. The people of Manchester gave me the feeling as if this was my second home. This life-changing experience from moving to Iraq to the United Kingdom was, in his own words, one of the best decisions of my life, and I wouldn't trade this experience for the world. He is happily living his life, not identifying himself as an immigrant, but as a British citizen. My dad's migration history has taught me how hard he has worked in his life. This inspires me to work hard in the future so that I can taste the fruits of my labor and determination.